We'll be uh, continuing our studies in the book of Jude, and these verses are so good, we're hitting them again. So if you're following along in the New American Standard, we're around page 189. Jude, uh, verse 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the treasure of your word. We thank you for the spirit that can illuminate our hearts and minds to understand it. We ask today that you would help us, uh, Lord, to not just comprehend this academically, but to live it out for your glory, because you are worthy. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Aloha. So, um, the Gildersleeves have been here for 23 years. That's over a thousand Sundays. And I have been trying to keep track, but I, I lost count after about 700 times that Joe wore a Hawaiian shirt to service. <laughs> So the elders wanted to honor him by wearing Hawaiian shirts this morning. And people want to be like Joe, and, and uh, grown-up men want to dress like him. <laughs> so it is fortuitous that we're going through Jude 1, 24, and 25. And this uh, Joe put down many years ago as one of his favorite verses all time in the Bible, and uh, we are finishing up the book of Jude this morning, and then next Sunday, Lord willing, we'll start into the book of Genesis. So we've gone through the New Testament. We're going to start over. This morning, we want to address the same verses we looked at last week, but from the perspective of God's character, and there are three attributes that are described in these verses that we want to particularly address that God is able, he's the only God, and that God is eternal. And so let's look at each of these in turn. Last week we looked at the fact that, that God is able to keep us from stumbling, and we focused in particularly on our eternal security. That when you receive Christ and he is in you and the Holy Spirit has sealed you unto the day of salvation that you cannot be lost. And those who are truly born again make every effort to live for him. And that is a true measure of your Christianity. Well, we want to look at that same attribute, but not just with regard to our eternal security, but the fact that God is able to do anything according to his almighty character. And we have to add that qualifier because God cannot do some things, and the Bible tells us that God cannot lie, for example. He cannot do uh, evil. He cannot tempt people, nor does he want to, because he is always only holy. And holiness is not just something he does. It is who he is. He can't do otherwise. But within his character, God can do whatever he pleases that is within his nature. And so we want to look at God's omniscience in this first attribute. The Bible repeatedly, especially in the Old Testament, compares God, who is almighty, and that word is used 57 times in the Old Testament. The Old Testament compares God, who is almighty, to man-made gods that are blind and deaf and dumb. And we have many statements in the Old Testament comparing God with man-made idols, things made out of gold and silver that people fashion into their understanding of their man-made God, and then they bow down and worship it, and how 
ludicrous that is. In Psalm 115, we read that their idols are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. Those who, I'm sorry, they have ears but can't hear, noses they can't smell, they cannot feel. I think you get the idea. They have no power. When, they, when the person who made that idol has to move, he has to pick it up and put it on his shoulder and carry it because they have no feet. They cannot walk. They have no power at all. And then the last statement in verse 8 is those who make them will become like them. What is that? They will be powerless without any support or any help. They pray to a piece of stone or a piece of wood fashioned with gold or silver, but it cannot hear or answer their prayers or do any good for them. But then we read in that same psalm, our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. We looked at last time in Psalm 62 that power belongs to God. And again, the fact that he is omnipotent is not just something that he displays occasionally, but it describes the very essence of his being. He can't not be almighty or omnipotent. Our God is able. So we're talking about a the true God, the one true God who is omnipotent and man-made idols, which are, God is omnipotent and those idols are impotent, that is powerless. And this is displayed a number of different ways in scripture. As the Hebrew nation is under the, the foreign domination of various world empires, the question is, 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 the true God, the God of the Bible, all-powerful, or is he even more powerful than, than the gods of the nations? And so there's this constant battle throughout Old Testament history, and I wanted to go through a few of them. We start with Egypt. We know that God sent his servant Moses to go deliver his people from bondage in Egypt. And there, through the hand of Moses, God pours out 10 plagues. And those plagues were a judgment on the things that the people of Egypt worshipped. So what God was doing is, is showing that he's more powerful than those gods, the things that they worshipped. And that is said outright in Exodus 12. Against all the gods of Egypt, the Lord says, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So as we look at each of those ten plagues, each one is poured out, out upon those things that the Egyptians held as deities. The Nile, the, the beast of the field, and, and even Pharaoh himself they worshipped. And so... God would show that he is more powerful than all of those. And he sent various plagues. I will send all my plagues on you in order to, number one, show you my power. And second of all, to proclaim my name throughout the whole earth. So God's purpose in sending his servant Moses back to Egypt was not only to deliver Israel from bondage in Egypt, but also to show the whole earth by his judgments on this pagan nation, his judgments upon their gods, that he is the one true God, and the man-made gods and idols, the things that they worshipped, are no gods at all, and they cannot help them. So there's this uh, chain of events that takes place in the book of Exodus. Moses comes before Pharaoh and says, let my people go. And in Egyptian, in so many words, Pharaoh says, no way, I'm not letting them go. I need them to make my bricks to build the pyramids and other wonders in the Egyptian empire. And so God sends a plague on Egypt. 
And Pharaoh says, okay, get out of here. I don't want to see your faces anymore. But then his heart is hardened and he changes his mind. And the whole thing starts over again. Ten cycles of this. And the interesting thing is we're told in the Bible that Pharaoh's heart was hardened because, get this, God hardened it. What does that even mean? So we, we read these statements through the book of Exodus that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and then maybe a couple verses later it'll say uh, Pharaoh's heart was hardened or Pharaoh hardened his heart. So the question is, does, does God, did God have to put evil in Pharaoh's heart for his heart to become hardened? I mean, that's a question that needs to be asked, and, and there needs to be a credible answer. We know that the Bible says that God is not tempted, nor can he tempt anyone. He doesn't tempt people to sin. That's contrary to the nature of God. We said God's very nature is holiness, and he can't act otherwise. Nevertheless, our hearts are in his hand. He's sovereign over the human heart. Even Pharaoh's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. So for God to harden Pharaoh's heart, he doesn't need to put any evil in that heart. It's already there. And God might restrain Pharaoh from that hardness for a moment. And he says, okay, go. And then he just removes some restraint. And the evil that is already resident within Pharaoh's heart takes over. And he says, no, I changed my mind. And God was doing that so that there would be these ten cycles of judgment upon Egypt and their false gods. That the whole earth would know that the God of the Hebrews is God. He saved them for the sake of his name that he might make his power known. That was the whole purpose of those plagues, to show that Jehovah is God, Yahweh, and that the gods of the Egyptians are not gods at all. We move on down through history to the Babylonian Empire. Um, Actually, before that, while Israel and Judah have separated, there's a divided kingdom, and the northern ten tribes ruled by Ahab, who we're told was more evil than any of the kings before him. So you read about each of these kings, and it says, okay, this king was evil, and then his son becomes king, and it says that he was even more evil than all before him. And then we keep reading that same statement. For each of Israel's kings, they just become more wicked more evil, and they even promote the worship of the gods of the nations. Now, they didn't totally give up on Yahweh, but they had kind of a pantheon of gods. We worship Yahweh and the gods of the nations. And one of the gods that Ahab, the wicked king of Israel, encouraged because of his wife Jezebel, who was a Phoenician princess, and the Phoenicians worshipped Baal and the Ashtoreth. And so Ahab built temples in Israel on the high places to Baal. Baal was the lord of the rain and fertility and prosperity. Remember when God told Elijah, Go and tell Ahab that I'm going to stop the rain for three and a half years. What was that a judgment on? Baal, who was the god of rain. God showing to Ahab and the northern ten tribes, I'm, I'm, I'm God. And Baal is an idol. He cannot help you. They built their temple on high places, which is uh, why there was this showdown on Mount Carmel between Ahab and Elijah. And also, in the practice of the worship of Baal, they they sacrificed their own babies. 
So the characters in this showdown were Elisha, and it says in 1 Kings, all of Israel showed up. Now, that is a generality. All, obviously, all of Israel was not there, but those who were interested, the tribal leaders and so forth, certainly were there. There were many there on Mount Carmel. Ahab was there. doesn't mention Jezebel, but she likely was there. And the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah were there. And so it's Elijah against all of this. So Elijah assembles the people of Israel that are there. And he says to them, how long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, then follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. And the people said, that's a good idea. And he proposed a challenge. It would be the, the great barbecue challenge on Mount Carmel. You build an altar, sacrifice an oxen, and put it on the altar with the wood, and I'll do the same thing. And the God that answers by fire, the God that ignites that sacrifice, he is God. And Israel said, all right, I like this. And so Elijah gave the prophets of Baal the first turn. And from morning until noon, they danced around their sacrifice and cried out to Baal. And Elijah mocked them. Some little sovereignly inspired mockery. Perhaps Baal is asleep and needs to be awakened. And so the, the prophets of Baal, as was one of their customs, they took their knives and swords out and started slashing themselves to show their sincerity. They cried out with a loud voice to Baal. And there was nothing. And then it was Elijah's turn. And just so that there would be no mistake, he ordered that four large pitchers of water be poured over the sacrifice, over the wood, and over the stones. There was so much water that it filled up the trenches around the sacrifice. And then Elijah prayed. You don't need to arouse God's favor or wake him up. Christian, your God never sleeps or slumbers. He's a very present help in time of need. By one simple prayer, Elijah said, O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Today, let it be known that you, O oh Lord, are God. Simplest little prayer. And God came down with such a ferocity that there was a fire that consumed the sacrifice and the wood was burned and the rocks were consumed by the fire. How hot was that fire? And it licked up all the water in the trench. God showed that he is the one true God. And the gods of the nations are a delusion. So now we look at Babylon. And the Babylonians came in. They, after conquering the Egyptians, they came in and, and subdued Israel and Judah. And in 605... Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were deported to Babylon. And they were put in the king's business. And, and sometime later, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, uh, destroyed Jerusalem and its temple was burned. Somewhere in between those two events, Nebuchadnezzar built a golden statue of himself. And it was ordered that at the sound of the trumpets, all of those there would bow down and fall on their knees and worship the golden statue of Nebuchadnezzar, essentially worshiping Nebuchadnezzar himself. Well, of course, the, the Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had a problem with that because they would only worship Yahweh. 
And so Nebuchadnezzar said, if you do not worship, you will be immediately cast into the fiery furnace. And here it is. What God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Man, he's throwing down the gloves. There's no God that Nebuchadnezzar had ever seen that could rescue these boys. But you know the outcome of that. They were thrown into the furnace. The men that carried them in bound were consumed by the fire, which had been stirred up seven times hotter than normal. And in the fire, they saw the three Hebrew boys, and they couldn't have been much older than their late teens or early 20s. They said, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not going to worship you. Before they were thrown in, they said, our God, if he wants, he's able to deliver us out of your hand. So they were thrown in. And in the furnace, a fourth figure appeared. And every commentator who's worth his salt believed that that was a Christophany, a pre-incarnate visitation of Jesus Christ with these three Hebrew boys in the furnace. So he spared them from the fire. They're taken out. And Nebuchadnezzar makes this statement here. There is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. And he prays to Yahweh. He says, now I see that you're able to humble those who exalt themselves. Uh, something happened in Nebuchadnezzar. Whether he was converted or not is yet to be determined. So after Nebuchadnezzar's Babylonian empire, the Medes and the Persians sweep in and they conquer Babylon. There are two regions. There's Darius the Mede, who actually is in Babylon when the last king there is destroyed, is killed, and he takes the seat in Babylon. And then the other co-regent is Cyrus, who was over the Persian Empire. And Daniel now is an old man. He's, he's o over 80 years old. And he's distinguished himself by being a man of wisdom. And Darius appoints him as a commissioner, there's three commissioners and 120 sub-commissioners or satraps underneath those three, and they govern the whole kingdom. And Daniel's one of those commissioners. And Darius was considering making him over the whole kingdom, over all the commissioners and all the satraps. The other commissioners didn't much like that, and so they knew that Daniel would only worship and pray to his God. And they tricked Darius into signing a decree. And once the Medes and the Persians signed a decree by the emperor, it could not be revoked. And Darius was flattered by these other commissioners who said, hey, Darius, you know, we all should just be praying and, and worshiping you. So why don't you sign a decree that everybody in the next 30 days should only pray or petition you? And Darius says, yeah, that sounds pretty good. So the decree was signed. It was in force for 30 days. Now, when Daniel had heard that the decree was passed, what did he do? Well, Lord, I won't be talking to you for a month. We'll see you after this is over. No. Daniel prayed like he had every other day. And he didn't do that in hiding. But it was soon discovered that Daniel was praying to his God and not to Darius. And the decree, the edict had to be enforced. So Darius reluctantly throws Daniel into the lion's den, though he really loved Daniel and trusted him. Isn't that interesting? Here's a pagan king. This might uh, have some simil similarities to the situation we're in. There were godly men in that government that had an effect on that wicked king. 
pray for our representatives and, and the people who aspire to some political office that God might even use them in our current situation. So Daniel was in the lion's den overnight and Darius was so upset. And in the morning he went to the den and he said, Daniel, has your God, whom you serve, been able? That's the question. Is he able to deliver you from the lions? And of course, Daniel was delivered by God and the commissioners were thrown into the lion's den. And finally, we look at our own country. There's a showdown that is starting in the United States between righteousness and wickedness, between Christians and the one true God and false religion, man-made religion. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. You can't serve the Lord and anything else. You see, our God is a jealous God, and he will have all of your affections. So just to summarize all of this, we, we would have to say, okay, we're not primitive idol worshipers, right? We, we don't carve totem poles or stone and then bow down and worship. We're smarter than that. We're a first world nation technology, all of that, right? Uh, we're, we're sophisticated idol worshipers. And Americans really worship the same things that the people of man-made religion have always worshipped. That is power, money, authority, pleasure, all of those things. And, and we even look back at the worship of Baal, the god of prosperity, infant sacrifice? Aren't those two big characteristics of the country we live in? We really haven't come too far, have we? But you, Christian, can stand up and have your voice heard. You can be a light. You can keep praying because our God is God. Worship him. The psalmist says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We can't say that anymore. Our money says, in God we trust, but only you, Christian, really do that. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. The writer of Proverbs says that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people, and our, our nation is being disgraced. Other nations used to look to the United States as a world leader in so many things. But oh, how the mighty have fallen. We look now at the fact that God is the only God. We looked in some of our previous studies, and I, I said to you, currently in the world, there are no less than 10,000 man-made religions. And that also means there are at least 10,000 man-made gods. Some of these religions have thousands of gods themselves. So it's not like we have been uncreative in inventing idols and religions. But it's Christianity and the worship of the one true God and then all the religions of men. And it's not an overgeneralization to say that man-made religion is characterized by the, the doing of certain rules and regulations of that religion. If you do these, maybe, hopefully, if you've done enough, you might go to their version of paradise or heaven. The Lord said through the prophet Jeremiah, the gods of the nation are a delusion like a scarecrow in a cucumber field. I love this analogy because it's so ridiculous, but that's what it's like. That's what your man-made gods are like. They're just a scarecrow. And again, they can't help you. They can't talk. They have no power. You made it. Why would you worship the work of your own hands? 
The Lord says, I am the first and I am the last. There is no God beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. Beside me, there is no God. Christian, there is one God. You have chosen well. Or rather, God has chosen you. You belong to him. You are the people of God. Worship him exclusively. Don't chase after the things that everybody else chases after because you belong to Christ. Choose for yourself today whom you will serve. But Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Is that your resolve? You must make a decision. You can't have one foot in the church and one foot in the world. Why do you hesitate between two decisions? Elijah said. Joshua says, choose whom you will serve. Make a decision. Don't be lukewarm in your Christian walk. You're either all in or you're out. Christianity is not an experiment, something you dabble in and try and see if it works. It's an all-out commitment. Does that describe you? Finally, in these last verses of Jude, we read that God is eternal. He's before all time, now and forever. Before time, now and forever. What a description. The only psalm written by Moses, Moses says, Before the mountains were born, or you gave birth to the earth, before there was anything, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Before time? You see, time and space and matter, they all three have to go together. That's just good physics, good science. And before there was a universe, there was no time, there was no space, and there was nothing but God for all eternity past. I mean, wrap your mind around that. He is the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. So we could say, without really fully understanding what we're saying, that there are three realms of existence. There is the physical realm that God created in which men particularly dwell. Then there is the spiritual realm, which God also created, in which angels particularly dwell, and also those who have died and their spirit is now in that spiritual realm with the Lord. But there's a third realm. It's a realm that only God inhabits. And for lack of any better term, here, the Bible says that's eternity. God inhabits eternity. It's not a place. It's not located somewhere. It's a timeless dimension, which I suppose is, is God himself. God lives in an eternal now. So the past and the present and the future for God are all at once. He's in time, he's in the universe, but he's also outside of the things that he created. He's not bound by them. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. And so the only name that rightly describes him is I am. He eternally is, not was, or will be, but he always is. He sees past, present, and future all at once. And I suppose if we can make any sense of what we're speaking of here, he who is outside of time is in the past and the present and the future all at once. I am. 
So God is outside of time, which he created. He's not bound by his own creation. He created the physical and spiritual realms, but it's not bound by them. And he alone inhabits eternity. We, by nature, are not eternal creatures, neither are angels. God is the source of all life, and he gives it. His life is inherent. The life that we experience, even if it's through eternity, is derived. He has to give it. If for one second God ceased to give life to you, you would cease to exist. So we are eternal only in the sense is that God eternally sustains us. The same for angels. God created the physical and spiritual realms, not bound by them. He alone inhabits eternity. And science and reason require an uncaused cause of all things. This is good science. To say that something came out of nothing is bad science. It's illogical. There has to be an uncaused cause of everything. And you, Christian, have the only reasonable explanation of the existence of all things, and that is God. But this God who is transcendent, He's above all things. He's outside of time and space, he says. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I dwell on a high and holy place and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit. So this God who is able, he's the only God and he's eternal. He's transcendent. We we can't measure him by any dimension. He also dwells with his people. Our God is a refuge and a strength, a very present help. He's right here. This God that we worship. He's here for you, Christian. He's not far off. He is far off, but for you. He's a very present help. I know you're going through some stuff. I mean, this last year we've gone through some difficult times. But God has sustained you. Keep trusting in him. He is the only hope for you. That's your message. And go out and share that message of hope with your friends and your family, anyone who will listen. Yours is a reasonable faith. And so, this is the God that we worship. The able, only, and eternal God. And our response should be unbridled praise. Unhindered worship. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Let that be our marching orders. Live the rest of your days to worship him because he is worthy to be praised. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your kindness toward us. You've been always